Hello everyone and welcome to Crown Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic, we review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabba Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So today we picked another randomized clinical trial for you, uh, recently published in the British Journal of Surgery. Um, this will be followed by uh, a teaching session by Professor Saba Balasubramanian on uh, efficacy versus effectiveness trial and intention to treat analysis. So uh, we are discussing a paper today about um, comparison of duration of hospital stays um, between a laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy and opal distant pancreatectomy, um, which uh, was published in PGA's April 2020. Um, it's a randomized controlled trial, happened in Sweden, um, and that was uh, started in September 2015 to January 2019. Right, Gio, you've got the ball. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a, a reasonably hot topic. Uh, there has been one uh, previous randomized controlled trial um, comparing uh, laparoscopic versus open distal pancreatectomy, um, showing uh, a, a faster recovery uh, as well as a shorter hospital stay uh, with equivalent uh, clinical outcomes. However, that particular trial was only talking about cancer patients. Here we have a bit of a mixture. Um, length of stay, generally speaking, is a very important health economic metric, is uh, recognized uh, throughout the board, not just in surgery, also in the specialties. Um, if we do a little bit of math and we think how much uh, uh, generally uh, an open distal pancreatectomy cost, that's between uh, seven and ten thousand pounds, and I can uh, send you a reference for that um, on the chat later. Uh, a hospital day, uh, based on data from 2008 is roughly 400 to 800 dollars so if we manage to you know take out a little bit of that uh, from the hospital data that probably will mean a significant um, improvement in terms of cost um, there's also evidence that minimally invasive surgery does reduce hospital stay in other surgical settings such as colorectal surgery and particularly uh, sigmoid and anterior sections um, and so generally speaking, yeah, I think it's a good topic. So ball back to you, mate. Right. Um, so looking at the background, there was only one RCT that was done in this um, subject, and that was Leopard trial. Um, that was based on the cancer resections, and uh, they were looking into the post-operative uh, surgical outcomes and uh, including the less length of stay, um, bleeding tendencies, um, and obviously the complication risks and rates as well. Um, the hypothesis which has been for this study is that they presume that laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy would shorten the length of stay for patients un undergoing distal pancreatectomy compared to open uh, distal pancreatectomy. Um, do, you, do you want to take in? Yeah, sure. So if I have to translate this into a PICO, uh, uh, format. Well, patients are patients that are needing, for whatever reason, in this case, a distal pancreatectomy. Uh, the intervention in this case is the laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy, uh, which is compared with what's considered the standard, which is open distal pancreatectomy. And the primary outcome of this study is solely and only length of stay. There's a group of secondary outcome that we will dig into later on. So, ball back to you, mate. Right, so um, they managed to get the trial registered back in September 2015. Um, the trial was run from September 2015 to February 2019. So it was randomized, controlled trial, unblinded, parallel group, single center superiority trial, uh, meaning uh, that um, they wanted to s suggest that the laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy is superior to the open distal pancreatectomy. Um, all patients undergoing planned distal, distal pancreatectomy were screened. Uh, the patients were screened basically in outpatient settings. 
And from there onwards, the inclusion and exclusion criteria were used and the one who fit or satisfied the inclusion criteria were randomized uh, to the two limbs of the trial. Um, as mentioned earlier, the primary outcome was length of stay. Um, they generally looked at the length of stay at the hepatobiliary center, along with that secondary outcomes of total days the patient stayed in hospital, including back to the referral hospitals, and uh, their outcomes, other secondary outcomes were their readmission rate or the days, including the readmissions in the next 90 days from the day of operation. Um, the other secondary outcomes they measured were um, time to recovery, functional recovery, basically readmission rates and uh, um, post-operative complications. Um, this is a funded study. The study was funded by Medical Research Council of Sweden. Uh, right. Do you, do you want to explain this diagram for us, please? Yeah. So, um, as Aslan mentioned, uh, only one surgeon was performing the uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, distal pancreatectomies. Um, they used this diagram to explain it briefly. It's a fairly standardized procedure. There's actually a paper that described it in detail, and I'll post it later on in the chat. Um, to summarize it briefly, uh, they gain uh, access, they use four ports, they use the supraumbilical port uh, as the extraction port, so that gets a little bit bigger. Um, they uh, take down the splenic flexure, uh, they uh, work between the colon and the kidney, uh, and uh, they uh, free up the stomach, they identify the pancreas, and then they use what they call the clockwise approach. So they basically move uh, from uh, the inferior uh, parts of the pancreas, uh, moving their dissection uh, in a clockwise manner until they have enough space to put a stapler, um, staying obviously always on the lateral side of the superior mesenteric vein and with gradual compression they then get rid of the pancreas that they want to get rid of. Uh, that's about it really in summary. Okay, right. Um, it's a uh... So this is the concert diagram of uh, showing how the patients were allocated, enrolled, allocated, and then follow-up analysis. So in total, 105 patients were eligible for to, to be enrolled on the study. Uh, 45 of them were excluded as 37 did not meet the criteria. Five patients declined and three patients missed the inclusion, I believe, so deadline or um, something. So in total, 60 patients were randomized. Out of them, 30 were in the laparoscopic group and 30 were in the open. Um, in the laparoscopic group, 29 patients received intervention. One did not as the disease progressed. Um, in the open group, 28 patients received intervention at the center while one patient had the operation in another hospital, which was excluded. Um, Another patient who had the laparotomy and only biopsy was performed, but was included at the trial was run as intention to treat. Um, they didn't lost any patient in their follow-ups in either of the limbs, and uh, the analysis was performed on 29 patients on both the groups each. Um, looking at the results, um, the primary outcome Clearly, there is a statistical significance in that the laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy group patients had less uh, length of stay as compared to the open distal pancreatectomy. Uh, the secondary outcomes looking into the post-operative stay, including referral hospital stays, um, they were significant six to eight, and the time to functional recovery which they defined as patients who were able to take oral intake, IVs off, can mobilize, and does not require any other uh, medication uh, intravenously or, or, or even injectables apart from Delta Parent or VT prophylaxis, basically. And that was statistical significant as well. Um, Gio, do you want to explain the pathology outcomes, please? Yeah, so uh, as you can, as you can, uh, see from this table, uh, quite a lot of different um, conditions were included in this trial, from IPMN, cystic tumors, neuroendocrine tumors, southern carcinomas, a few uh, symptomatic chronic pancreatitis patients as well. Um, it's a very low volume um, 
procedure. Uh, if you think about it, it's only 105 patients uh, in the space of four years in one of the biggest centres um, in uh, Sweden. So, um, unfortunately, uh, if we go down to one very important histological outcome, that would be our zero resections. We don't really have enough numbers to uh, have a meaningful outcome here. So uh, it would be nice to know that. Uh, I think it would be very important. Uh, the remaining of the indications, uh, yes, uh, an R0 resection is very important, but not as much as when you're dealing with another carcinoma. So that's really the main thing I wanted to say about this table. Um, so back to you, mate. Yeah, that's fine. Just one quick thing I wanted to mention um, in, in, with regards to the outcomes or results is that in this trial, the overall complication rate um, or the complications specifically related to the pancreatic surgery, namely fistula, uh, uh, pancreatic fistula, were similar in both the groups. But if you look into the previous RCT, that suggested that the complication rates were high in the laparoscopic group than the open uh, distal pancreatectomy group. Um, right, I looked at the limitations. Um, Again, the generalizability or reproduce, reproducibility of the results will be low as it was a single center study. Um, there was a low proportion of the cancer patients in, the, in, the, in, in both the groups, and there was no conclusion that we can make out based on this trial about the oncological adequacy or oncological resection for the tumours, uh, either of the groups, uh, especially in the laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy. Um, other limitations which they have mentioned in the paper were based on the fact that there was only one laparoscopic surgeon and uh, the study was started after almost 40 patients have already been operated, uh, operated sorry, in the laparoscopic uh, group, which is actually double the number of patients that was suggested uh, for the learning curve for that procedure. Um, conclusions, um, I think this study definitely validates the outcomes um, related to length of stay, which was proposed earlier by the Leopard trial. Um, less uh, post-operative pancreatic fistula um, complications were reported um, for laparoscopic group as compared to the previous trial. Um, there, there are limitations in, 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 in this study as a single centered, um, uh, less number of patients recruited in the cancer care, cancer, cancer, care, cancer pathologies. Um, I think so there is another trial that's currently ongoing, which is a diploma trial, which is a multi-central trial. Um, so further um, research work is required um, to further evaluate the results. Thank you. So we're going to talk about um, efficacy versus effectiveness as two different types of trials, uh, almost on a philosophical level. And then we'll move on to what we call intention to treat principle um, or intention to treat analysis as a mode of analysis in randomized controlled trials. OK. Right. So we need an example just to put things uh, into context. We could consider the example that we've just discussed or another example that I've got on the screen, uh, which is a comparison of laparoscopic versus open surgery in acute appendicitis. Which one is better in terms of post-op stay, length of stay, and serious complications? So I put this example up as I thought that for almost all surgical trainees, CT level and upwards, uh, you would uh, have some idea of uh, the decision making and the management of patients with acute appendicitis, uh, and um, you might uh, probably correctly assume now that laparoscopic appendicitis, appendicectomy is a standard treatment, but 20 years ago, there was a big debate as to whether laparoscopy is better in terms of uh, a number of uh, clinical outcomes. So we'll keep that in the back of our minds while we discuss and the differences between efficacy and effectiveness trials. Okay. So, efficacy trials are also called explanatory trials, and effectiveness trials are called pragmatic trials. Now, as I go through the differences, 
I hope um, it'll uh, the differences between the, the meaning of these trials and the similarities and differences will become clear. But these are all randomized controlled trials, so that's the uh, most important thing to keep in mind. So efficacy trials essentially talks about how well an intervention does in ideal and controlled conditions in a very controlled environment. How good um, is the intervention? Or, and in this instance, how good is the laparoscopic uh, technique? So that includes a combination of the insufflation, the pores that you use, the instruments and the techniques you use in grasping the appendix, controlling the meso appendix, and ligating the base, and so on and so forth. Uh, as opposed to effectiveness or pragmatic trials, the, uh, um, the question is how well does it uh, do in the real world? In the average, say, DJ setting, uh, in the hands of the average surgeon on call. Efficacy trials answer the question, can this work? Whereas effectiveness looks at, does it work in real life? There's really a subtle difference between the, uh, between the two, um, but, there is, uh, but the d difference is distinct. So in efficacy trials, you're trying to show whether the technique uh, can work. And in effectiveness trials, you're showing whether it actually works, given the context you find yourself in, which would be uh, in an acute situation, um, in patients of varying ages, different comorbidities, different BMI, and so on and so forth. Um, and in general, efficacy trials aim to show proof of principle, whereas effectiveness trials look at proof of practical utility. Okay, so we'll just expand on this a little bit more. There is a paper that I've referenced to in the slide that you can click on and um, do some background reading as well if you are interested. Right. So let's just consider the setting of an efficacy trial. So in an efficacy trial, you ideally try and um, conduct the trial in an uh, ivory tower of excellence where you have skilled laparoscopists. Not that in other places they aren't skilled, but what I'm trying to say is laparoscopic surgeons who have a high uh, volume of um, laparoscopic surgery under the belt and have loads of experience. You give them the best possible equipment, the stacker, the ports, give them staples if they need, uh, if they need it, hemostatic devices, and so on and so forth, which you probably won't have access to in the real world. So what I'm trying to say here is that here you're looking to see if the technology and the equipment will do the job safely. That's what you're looking to see in an efficacy trial. In an effectiveness trial, however, you will um, uh, see if it is, works safely and uh, in the context of maybe the, the equipment being not so good, maybe the average laparoscopist not being an experienced laparoscopic surgeon like some of the laparoscopic colorectal surgeons are, and you may not necessarily have access to expensive equipment like staplers and hemostatic devices. Okay. If, with regards to population, in efficacy trials, you usually try and, uh, and keep the population as homogeneous as possible because you're testing the technology here. That's the key thing. So you might um, find that these efficacy trials have extremely strict eligibility criteria. And uh, they probably would have limits on BMI, com comorbidity, maybe even age. They might also want to stipulate that uh, the, di the diagnosis should be made with reasonable certainty, and that can be a problem with appendicitis. And they might have limits on previous surgery and so on. Whereas effectiveness trials, um, again, in the real world, you know, um, you are assessing and the technology in the context of its use. Now, in terms of conduct of the trial, in efficacy trials, usually they're single center, they have plenty of resources to ensure homogeneity, not just of the population, but also of the equipment. You make sure that all the equipment is spot on and, that, and uh, um, all the needs of the surgeons are met. You also evaluate a number of different outcomes at multiple time points. So you might have uh, research fellows or clinical uh, nurse specialists or clinical or nurse researchers going around recording pain and other measures at multiple time points. And um, uh, think, measuring things that you wouldn't normally measure in routine clinical practice. There is this potential um, for the halo effect because uh, um, lots of um, outcomes are going to be measured, lots of parameters are going to be checked, and if there are, a, there is a potential for complications, then they would be acted upon um, almost immediately. 
and they do their best to minimize the attrition. Attrition is loss of um, follow-up, loss of the patient um, for one reason or the other where you can't collect data. So they'll do the best to minimize that. And effectiveness trials uh, are not necessarily um, conducted with um, such extra you know, uh, resources and, and then at such an intensive level. Right. So in terms of outcomes, efficacy trials usually are short term and therefore um, there's um, less missing data, whereas effectiveness trials uh, are usually medium to long term and uh, you might be interested in looking at whether patients come back with small bowel obstruction or hernias, either at the port site or in the open appendix incision and so on and so forth. And just by nature of the long term collection of data, you're going to have a lot more missing data. Most important thing next, uh, 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 that I'm going to talk about next is validity. So we talked about external validity, and we said how external validity depends on your PICO, population, intervention, comparator, and outcomes. And because efficacy uh, trials are done in such a, a homogeneous environment, both in terms of patient population, as well as in terms of the availability of resources, external validity as you'd ima imagine, is going to be a little bit limited. So I've said before that it's usually a single center trial with very experienced laparoscopic surgeons and, all, and with all the facilities in the world because you're trying to demonstrate uh, that the technology works. Can you take the appendix out safely with the technology? And therefore, the external validity would be limited or low. Whereas in effectiveness trials, um, it's the other way around. Uh, you want to do the trial in maybe five or six different centers, you want to use the average general surgeon or the registrar on call and get them to do either a laparoscopic appendicectomy or an open operation. Um, and this is going to be um, out of hours. Uh, and therefore, if you prove that the laparoscopic approach is better in such a pragmatic environment, that means the results are going to be externally valid. So effectiveness trials usually have high external validity. Okay, so we, we come on to the last difference, and that's in the analysis. In the efficacy trial, you can do either what we call a per protocol analysis or an intention to treat analysis. While in effectiveness trials, it's almost always recommended that we only do an intention to treat analysis. Now, what does this mean? That's the topic uh, um, that we're going to discuss next. Um, intention to treat analysis vis-a-vis -vis per protocol analysis. So just bear with me for uh, a couple of minutes. Now, most trials that you will read about are going to be combinations of efficacy and effectiveness trials. So we shouldn't be thinking about it as black or white. It's a spectrum and your trial can lie anywhere along the spectrum. Uh, some of them are more efficacy than effectiveness, and some of them are the other way around. So um, you can't just put them put trials in boxes of efficacy and effectiveness. Well, you can, but you have to keep in mind that some of them would be difficult to box in, and some of them might have some characteristics of efficacy trials and some characteristics of effectiveness trials. And it's, in reality, a spectrum ranging from efficacy to effectiveness. Okay, so I hope that uh, made some sense. We'll now move on to intention to treat principle and uh, well, again and dwell on the same example that we're talking about. So the example is um, a trial comparing laparoscopic and open surgery in patients, let's say adult patients with acute appendicitis who are awaiting surgery. So let's say you've got 100 patients or you plan a, plan a trial to look at 100 patients and 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 you um, try to ensure uh, relatively equal numbers in both arms. Well, here they are equal. So you've got 15 in each arm. Right, so in the laparoscopic arm, you manage to do a laparoscopic appendicectomy in 40 patients. And in 10 patients, you have to change to an open operation. Okay, and this is real life. This happens. And in the open arm, you've done an open appendicectomy in 48 patients. And for one reason or the other, the patients, um, two patients in the open arm did not have open surgery. They had laparoscopic surgery instead. 
Okay, so that's interesting, isn't it? Right, so these are the final treatments. The final treatments are in the lap arm, 40 head laparoscopy, 10 head open, in the open arm, 48 head open, and 2 head laparoscopy. Now, what do we do then? How do we analyze these patients and how do we compare laparoscopy versus open? So, you can either compare in one group laparoscopy and those where um, lap was converted to open in one group versus those where the open um, surgery was the intended surgery uh, and where the open was uh, changed to laparoscopy at the last minute. So you can either do that and compare these two groups as they were randomized. Or you can say, hang on a minute, I don't want to mix these uh, groups in. I would simply like to compare laparoscopy versus open in accordance to the final treatment they received. So then in one arm, you'll have laparoscopy, uh, that is 40 patients where laparoscopy was intended. And then an additional two patients from the open arm where, the, where we changed to laparoscopy. And the other group, you have patients who had open surgery um, um, in the um, open randomized arm, plus another 10 patients uh, from the laparoscopy group where they had a conversion. So there are two ways of analyzing these data sets from this randomized control trial. Now, I'll just open um, um, up for thoughts for a couple of minutes. So, uh, you and Arslan, I'm going to ask you first to give me some scenarios where you think and the laparoscopic arm had um, ended up with open operations. So these are patients with acute appendicitis, and they come through to your uh, through your A&E to your surgical assessment unit. You've gone to randomize them. You've randomized them into two arms, and they've been waiting for surgery. That might take a few hours, or it might be the next day. Um, and and uh, eventually you find that. Uh, um, 10 patients did not have um, laparoscopy as you intended, and two patients did not have open surgery as you specified. So what could the possible reasons be? Well, generally, generally I would, I would surgeon, surgeon preference. preference. Yeah. Uh, for uh, the open to lap uh, and uh, a nasty appendix that's not possible to take out the laparoscopy in the laparoscopy to open. I would say that those are the two common scenarios. Yeah, vice versa, it can be the patient preference as well um, on one to other. Or on top of that, if they have other comorbidities that prevent them having um, a laparoscopic surgery or previous operations, um, which risk them when well, they have previous adhesions, which will make laparoscopy technically challenging. Yeah, so so you, hopefully you've designed the trial in such a way that you have um, ensured that patients, the patients that you're randomizing into the trial met all the eligibility criteria and you considered appropriate for either laparoscopy or open, and then you randomize them and they, they got enrolled into one of the other treatment arms, okay? So that's where you need to take care that um, your eligibility criteria are pretty robust and that you don't have these issues of, uh, um, you've randomized and then you find, well, actually you can't do laparoscopic because you had five uh, laparotomies before. Despite your best design, you might change to open in the laparoscopy arm because you put the laparoscope in and you find whatever for whatever reason they've got Crohn's disease, excessive scarring, or I punctured the bowel or an artery or a vein and had to open to sort the injury out and then I did an open appendectomy. And um, so it could also be that it's not nothing to do with the patient, but the extraneous factors. Like for example, you wanted some equipment, you didn't have a loop or um, sorry the and um, what you call it to uh, like at the base of the appendix. Uh, so you don't have the appropriate instruments that you find after you put the ports in. Or let's say the patient has an arrhythmia and the anesthetist says, gas out, please. The patient, the appendix needs to come out in 20 minutes. Just get on with it. And you find that you're having to open. So lots of reasons, right? So the reason I'm exploring these reasons is that this can happen at any time until the surgery is complete. Okay. Now, if you look at the open arm, 
Uh, it'd be very unusual to plan an open appendicectomy and then change to lap, but all sorts of weird and wonderful things happen in the context of a trial. It could be that you randomize the patient, you've gone home, somebody else comes and says, well, actually, um, um, it's unfair to randomize this particular patient, I'm unhappy with it. Or the patient says, well, let me opt out of the trial after they've given informed written consent and after they've been randomized, it's their right. And they say to the surgeon in the anesthetic room, well, actually, I just want a keyhole operation, please. Yeah. Um, so, so there could be all sorts of reasons, some of which you will not um, anticipate. And even if you've anticipated all possible reasons by doing an extensive literature review and looked at all the other trials, you don't know how many propo what proportion of your patients um, will either change their minds or will have what we call protocol deviations. Okay, right. So uh, I then go on to, to the next question. So I said that you could either analyze the patients according to the treatment they were randomized to, or you could analyze the patients in the groups according to the treatment they actually received. So which one would you do and why? Um, why, why do you say that? Well, I would use the original groups they've been randomized to because that would be a more accurate reflection of what happens in real life. Okay, very good, yeah. And what if uh, I say that, um, uh, well, you're not really looking at um, the efficacy of laparoscopy if you have 10 patients that really didn't have laparoscopy. Yeah, that's true, but uh, in that w my intention was still to offer a laparoscopic surgery to those 10 patients as well. So uh, if I have to predict the outcome after I've taken a decision, uh, those 10 patients should be counted as it, as that decision has been made. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I think so. Yeah, what, it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, Arslan, have you got any comments? Yeah, what he wanted to say, probably, I think so what I what I gathered is that once uh, the patient has been randomized uh, to a certain limb or treatment A or treatment B, then they should be analyzed in that group, if I'm right? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, you both got it. Um, uh, all right. So, uh, but it sometimes appears counterintuitive. And a lot of people would say, people who um, haven't really um, read much about randomized trials um, or a lay person would say, well, actually, if you wanted to understand the, uh, the, the safety of laparoscopy and the efficacy of laparoscopy, um, shouldn't you not analyze the patients as to the treatments they actually receive, right? So the first method where you keep the patients in the groups they were randomized to refers to um, what we call intention to treat principle. The second method of analysis where you analyze in groups according to the final treatment they received is what we would call PP or per protocol analysis. Okay, so that's the difference between intention to treat and per protocol analysis. Now, we'll just explore this a bit more. So intention to treat analysis effectively refers to analysis of patients in accordance to the randomization the, um, or, or the randomized groups they were allocated to. Okay, now if this is irrespective of the treatment received and even if they've withdrawn for treatment or they were lost to follow up. Now withdrawn for treatment meaning if the patient was randomized to laparoscopy and they, you did not do the operation and the next morning uh, you find the patient's really well and somebody comes to you and says well actually the CRP is uh, virtually zero and the patient feels a whole lot better and the operation is cancelled, the purist will say that you have to keep the patient uh, in the uh, uh, laparoscopic arm and look at the length of stay or whatever you want to look at. Okay, so that, that might seem really um, uh, odd um, to, uh, to us, uh, but in the, in the number of trials, it makes perfect sense. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, per protocol analysis, on the other hand, it refers to analysis of patients as per treatment received. And if the patients uh, did not receive either of the treatments, and then they it can be excluded from the groups. Okay. Now, intention to treat is considered to be key to a good design and is recommended by consort. And like both of you said, it um, aims to 
replicate what could happen in the real world. So you could um, plan on the basis of this trial to introduce laparoscopic surgery in your department or your unit on the understanding that 5% or 10% of laparoscopic, laparoscopic procedures will fail and will have to have an open operation. But despite that, overall introducing laparoscopy in your practice will um, result in benefits um, or improvement in whatever outcomes you're interested in. Okay, so from an epidemiological or statistical um, uh, perspective, using the intention of treat analysis reduces the risk of you exaggerating treatment effects. And with our example in mind, it's fairly easy to see why. So if you just analyze patients who had laparoscopy and who had successful laparoscopy, then you've got a group that are going to do well with regards to outcomes. So you're going to potentially exaggerate the effects of laparoscopy if you exclude those that um, had a conversion. Okay. Now, depending on the context and the setting, intention to treat analysis potentially can reduce both your type 1 error and type 2 error rates. Now, type 2 um, error is essentially where there's a difference between two arms, but your study hasn't been able to demonstrate it. And type 1 error is where there isn't a difference, but spuriously, you potentially are claiming that there's a difference. So both of these errors potentially can be reduced by sticking to an intention to treat analysis. Okay. It also maintains a balance of confounding factors. Again, using our example of um, appendicectomy uh, in acute appendicitis, if you remove the converted patients, it could be that they are um, overweight or they've had multiple operations before. It could be that they have some other prognostic factors that will affect their outcome. So if you take them out of the equation or out of the laparoscopic group, then there will be an imbalance in the confounding factors. Okay, and just like we've been explaining, talking about external validity, intention treat analysis is extremely important for you to be able to say that your trial is externally valid or for you to be able to say my results are generalizable to um, other similar centers. Okay, right. But there are problems, and um, although the recommendation is that you stick with intention treat analysis for the, any trials that you may do, and you view with skepticism any RCT that has not done intention treat analysis, you have to be aware of a couple of little problems. Right. One is that you could be too cautious or too conservative. So if you have a lot of people that have had conversions and they have a bad outcome, that can just um, reduce your impact of uh, uh, the impact of benefit from laparoscopy or the benefits you're able to claim with laparoscopy. So your whole study becomes a little bit conservative. And uh, if in the unusual instance you have a lot of patients not getting what treatments they were randomized to, then even if the treatment is genuinely efficacious, then that may be masked. In other words, your type 2 error can go off. Okay, so what can you do? One potential solution, if you're doing a trial, is to do both intentional treat and per protocol analysis, report them as they are, and leave it to the reader and or, and, or the editor to make sense of it. But obviously, you explain in the discussion as well. Now, often in reasonably large trials, both these analyses will come to the same conclusion. So we hope they come to the same conclusion. If that's the case, then you don't have a problem. You're happy and you've done both analyses and, and uh, there will not be too much of a uh, too much uh, of a criticism. However, and uh, if they are different, then you've got a problem. You've got to try and explain the difference. Now, another potential solution is what we call post-randomization exclusions. So what this means is that um, you're allowed to exclude some patients after randomization in certain specific instances. So you do exclude them from the groups to which they've been randomized. You just take the data out, right? This is a bit complicated. It's best left to the experts or um, you should these days have a statistician as part of your team. So, um, so, so post-randomization exclusions um, can be done in some specific instances, not generally advised. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Now, what happens if no intervention is, um, has been received or no intervention has been done in a patient or two? 
the patient just did not have an appendicectomy after uh, being randomized. In those instances, um, you could make, an, uh, make a case for excluding those patients from either of the groups uh, for obvious reasons. It's important to try and anticipate this and say this in your trial protocol. We explain this in your trial protocol. Occasionally, um, randomization has happened before the assessment of um, eligibility um, or the randomized uh, patients randomized did not actually meet the inclusion criteria. There was an error or halfway through the trial and you shouldn't really find yourself in the situation, but it happens. Uh, you find that the inclusion criteria was too broad and uh, you had a number of patients who really didn't have appendicitis. You put the scope in and they had, um, you know, lots of, uh, uh, you know, one of the other possible diagnoses. And that other possible diagnosis is unequally distributed between the groups. And then you have a problem. So uh, there are some uh, exceptions that can be made uh, to performing an intention to treat analysis. But the general principle is um, uh, adhere to the intention to treat principle. Okay, right. So I've got three statements here and a quick question just to ensure that uh, we have understood these concepts um, and are these true or false? So first um, question is most human trials in surgery are trials of efficacy. What do you think? Uh, false because um, it's real world, isn't it? So effectiveness is the real world. Yeah, you hope that uh, it's all, they're all trials of effectiveness. Uh, I mean, you could do animal studies um, that could be trials of efficacy in, in a number of instances, uh, but human trials um, hopefully will all be trials of effectiveness. That's good. Yeah, great. Next is a good study design will minimize risk of patients crossing over to non-randomized treatments, um, like in the example shown in the context of the trial that we've discussed. True or false? I would say uh, probably true, especially for inclusion and exclusion criteria. Okay, um, so maybe, but it, it won't always, it won't always. Um, so whatever, however well you design the study, uh, you are not in control of the clinical events, patients changing their minds um, after randomization so, or problems with, you know, laparoscopic approach. You, you can't be in control of... Uh, um, or um, you can't ensure uh, or you can't do anything to reduce your conversion rate. That's dependent on the surgeon and the and what they find at surgery. You can't do anything about patients changing their mind. So you can design the trial as well as you can, but you, uh, you cannot um, negate crossover. Yeah. So you have to anticipate it and you have to prepare for it. OK. Right. So adopting the intention to treat principle will increase the internal validity of the study. What do you think? Should Ashton? I go again? Yeah, go, go for it. Okay. Well, uh, it does increase definitely external validity of the study. Uh, yes. As far as internal validity goes, um, it shouldn't really affect the internal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to ensure, just to emphasize that it's the external validity or the generalizability that you uh, influence by adopting this principle. Okay. So intention to treat principle is for external validity and it's um, of use in um, effectiveness trials, not efficacy trials. Okay. Right. So we've talked about efficacy um, and effectiveness trials. Uh, I tend to think of this as uh, can it work trials, efficacy trials, versus does it actually work, um, effectiveness trials. Okay, there is a subtle difference between the two. Right, and then we talked about intention to treat versus per protocol analysis. And uh, I've, I've emphasized that intention to treat is recommended and is preferable in the vast majority of trials that you and I will come across. Doing both analysis is an option, and if the results are different, i.e. the treat new treatment is probably superior to the standard as per intention to treat and maybe there's no difference as per protocol, then you've got to be very careful with how you draw inferences and how you interpret your results. Okay, thank you very much.